Okay, he was wondering, if adult stem cells are so great, why is there such a controversy between embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells? And it comes down to money. Geron Corporation, hi guys, owns all the patents for embryonic stem cells, all the use patents. So anytime anybody uses embryonic stem cells for treatment, they get a royalty. They get a cut of the pond. Okay? Back when Jamie Thompson and Thomas Gearhart, they were funded by Geron Corporation, by the way, uh, published their results. A few months later, there was a letter sent to, I think, whomever it was, Reagan or whatever, one of the conservatives, saying we ought to do embryonic stem cell research. And it was signed by 40 Nobel laureates. But being the person that I was, I looked up the names on the internet, and none of those Nobel laureates were in science. And I called one up, and I asked, and he said, well, Geron Corporation paid me to sign the letter. Wow. Okay? It's money. Now, the other thing is, I work at Mercer University Macon, which is a teaching medical school, okay? I don't work at Harvard, I don't work at Stanford, I don't work at whatever. They are pushing embryonic stem cells because they can repair anything. Guess what, guys? Adult stem cells can do the same thing. Two years ago, I took 13 people with me to Snowbird, Utah. It's an international meeting on stem cells. We blew the doors off because it was an embryonic stem cell meeting. First day, it was, let's see now, Megan, Megan, that's in the state of Atlanta, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> you got this confused. <laughs> you have Georgia. Atlanta's in the upper left-hand corner. If you put a, you know, took an arrow or a dart, middle of the state, that's Megan, Georgia. That was the first day. And they didn't believe our results. Second day, they knew at least where Megan was, and they knew their... Atlanta and Georgia were not the same thing as far as state and city were concerned. By the third day, they were kind of, uh, by, the, by the sixth day, they were saying, can we, can we collaborate with you? You know, that sort of thing. And basically, this, you know, when we were in Vancouver last year, basically the same thing. We went to an embryonic stem cell meeting, and I took 12 people with me, and we all presented on adult stem cells, and we blew them out of the water. Um, it's so ingrained that the only thing that you have in your body are progenitor cells. And you talk to an embryonic stem cell person, and they'll say, you have progenitor cells in your body that will decrease with age, they're not plastic, and you're going to croak. Embryonic stem cells are plastic. We can make any cell in the body, no problem. They fail to mention mesodermal stem cells. Well, they're start mesodermal germinal lineage stem cells are now starting to become, more and more people are working on those. We worked on those 15 years ago. We're now working with the pluripotents and the totipotents. My lab is the only one in the world with the totipotent stem cells, and I'm only one of three labs in the world with pluripotent stem cells. So we're trying to publish, trying to get our stuff out there. It's just going to be a matter of time, and this will be. Yes? How does the um, Obama, the reversal, of, the reversal of the immunic stem cell research policy affect or influence your research in making? Well, all the money is going to be going to the embryonic stem cell researchers, okay? Now, I'm hoping some of that will trickle down to us. He's got an $8 billion stimulus package to NIH. They're called the NIH Challenge Grants. They're due April 27th. We are submitting about 20 grants <laughs> for that program across the board. Parkinson's, COPD, and, you know, it's multiple sclerosis, muscular dystrophy, diabetes, anything we can think of, we're submitting. Hopefully one or two will hit, and then we can move forward. And as soon as we start publishing in humans, embryonic stem cell people barely can get it to work in animals. And we're doing it right now. I'm going with the IRB. We've, okay. To do it in humans, you have to go through a series of experiments to prove that it's not harmful for humans. You have to do large animal studies before you can do human, animal, human studies. My large animal is a horse. So our first studies were done in horses. We have six of them. We've got the blood from those. We're going to count the cells. Then the next study has to be done on normal humans to make sure that we can have an increase in stem cells. We found, what I'm getting at, we found all of our previous experiments, we extracted the cells and put them back in. 
we have now found the compound where we don't have to do that. We just give a pill, it mobilizes the stem cells out to the periphery, they circulate in the blood and fix the problem, which is even better. But we have to prove that it's not harmful to humans. So um, we've done the first set in horses. Our second set, it's placebo versus experimentals, go into humans in about a month. And the law school has graciously obliged to help me with it. Uh, we're taking ages from 21 to 85. And all I need are 36 people. And your secretaries have already volunteered. So, whether you know it or not, and since my lab is over at the law school anyway, we can keep everybody in a kind of a closed situation. Here. Uh, then we can go to treat people. Now, I have a collaborator that's already in the people, and that's the one with the Parkinson's, and he's done COPD, and he's done, he's, he's taken everything under the sun as far as. And we're getting preliminary results from that. And everybody who's treated with this compound, they're getting better. We haven't had any, well, we've had some setbacks. One of the persons, COPD people, was at 60% O2 sat in the blood. Okay. He went up, he took the compound, got up to 90%, felt so good, he loved to play golf. He did three rounds, 18 rounds of golf back to back. Wow. Got worse. You know, yeah. Give me a break here. Uh, we had another person that had an epileptic that was on the medication. Since he's been on the medication, he hasn't had an epileptic fit or a seizure, and he was averaging two to three a day, so they're starting to wean him off his epileptic medicine, but he also had a rotator cuff injury. It felt real good. He did 40 push-ups. <laughs> Dumb! What can I say? You know, and, you know, unfortunately the researcher <coughs> can be just about as bad as the participants. Um, I had some people come by that I wanted to uh, uh, meet in my conference room, and I have some tr uh, other people's work in there that I consider trash, and I wanted to get rid of it. I have back problems, and I the hell with it, so I moved it out, and I wrenched my back, so you know, I take this stuff too. Um, I broke my leg in October, torsion fractured the left fibula into two places, broke it in two places. Physician wanted to put a pin in you know, still play the pin in it. I said, no, create more complications than what it's worth. And the reason is, I have systemic lupus. So anytime I get an inflammatory response, I get scar tissue formed. So my organ function is like 70%, you know, all this kind of stuff. So my, all my nerves coming out of my vertebral column are tethered with connective tissue and stuff. So anyway, it got worse, so yeah. But anyway, to back up to the bone story, Doctor said, okay, you've got to be on calcium and vitamin D to increase, you know, that. I said, okay, okay. And then my collaborator started feeding me these results in December on this the stuff. And I was going, shit, they can take it. Let me have some. So I started taking it. And the doctor said it would take you 12 to 16 months before you, I asked for a walking cast. 12 to 16 months before you'd be healed out of a walking cast. They took the cast off in January, and it's perfectly healed. Wow. Good stuff, good stuff. <laughs> so I believe in what I'm doing, to the point that I'm a guinea pig. Okay, yes. Um, so you're competing with the stem cell folk. Um, do you have anyone of influence or power who's listening to you to counter that so that your information can get out? I am publishing. We are publishing, we are presenting at national meetings. I, pre I was the keynote speaker in India two years ago for the Adult Stem Cell Conference there, for the International Stem Cell Conference. I speak, I'm going to be speaking at the anatomy, or excuse me, the experimental biology meetings in New Orleans later, let's see, this is in April, yeah. And they'll be doing it on the 19th of April in front of however many people want to show up, talking about the adult stem cells and what we can do with them. So it's kind of a grassroots approach type thing. But if Obama put most of his money towards um, embryonic stem cell, and we have this information out there, is that he doesn't know about it? Well, it's not so much he doesn't know about it. He gave money to NIH, okay? Now, I sit on, which is really crazy, I sit on NIH study sections, stem cell study sections, but I don't get any money. And the reason is there's 18 embryonic stem cell labs and maybe two adult stem cell labs, okay? All the money goes to embryonic stem cell labs because we're outvoted. 
It's one of those things. Uh, it's just the way it is. But if enough people get treated, grassroots, you know, we can go for the adults. And now there's people in the adult stem cell field that believe in the Mercedes-Benz approach, and there's people that believe in the Walmart approach. I believe in the Walmart approach. Get as cheap as possible, treat as many people as possible. Mercedes-Benz approach is treat few people, jack the price up. You know, so that's another thing. I, I guess the part I really don't understand is, I don't know if this has to do with ethics or whatever, but uh, uh, why, why your colleagues that have listened to you, you know, make your presentation and those that are, you know, even if they're in the field of, of, or, or, or in the area of uh, embryonic stem uh, cell research, why they're not supporting this more? I mean, if they really are, you know, interested in, in, in seeing you know, really positive outcomes. I mean, why aren't they doing that? Because their labs are geared to embryonic stem cells, not to adult stem cells. So they would have to completely retool. And most of the labs run on soft money. They don't run on hard money. I was paid by Mercer 21 years ago to teach. Research is just a sideline. I just happen to like to do research. But my main job is to teach. So I get paid by hard money. So it doesn't matter whether I get a grant or not. A lot of the embryonic stem cell labs, Harvard, Stanford, Duke, whatever, everybody runs on soft money. You don't get a grant, you're out. Whole field, herd, menta herd mentality, embryonic stem cells. My first pink sheet that I ever got back from NIH, I have it framed in my office, it says lunatic fringe on it. <laughs> because I had cloned cells before they had published on the embryonic stem cells, and I, I cloned in the mid-90s these cells that I presented. Mm -hmm. Embryonic stem cells weren't published until 1999. We published our first cloning paper in 2001, thinking, oh, maybe that guy's not the crack pie he, we thought he was. Last year, that cloning paper, the mesodermal cloning paper, got 600 hits. The ELSC cloning paper got maybe five hits, and we didn't get any hits on the blastomeric stem cell paper. They're just not far enough along. Lady in the back. Since there seems to be such a big debate and controversy over embryonic, and you know whether it be ethical or just with the research that you were talking about, do you think though in the long run, with so much being devoted toward embryonic, it will give some more validity to what you're doing and? Somehow, residually, it'll oh, yeah. be around. Most definitely. Now, I'm not against embryonic, okay. I'm against embryonic stem cell research as, a, as it applies to healing adults. But I'm not against embryonic stem cell research when it talks about healing embryos and fetuses in the womb. I teach embryology. There are a lot of disease, congenital diseases that could be healed if we knew what was going on. But before now, we weren't even allowed to work on human tissues. We work on animal tissues. And if anybody has, is as old as I am and remembers the thalidomide debacle of a long time ago, where uh, FDA said no thalidomide in the United States, Britain said, okay, it was an anti nausea drug. Kids came out with little flippers and no hands at all. No hands, no limbs. You know, so. The only thing that we could work on it, they could work on it at the time, it was a little bit young for that one, um, was rats and rabbits and mice and things like that. And they found out that rabbits were the ones they tested it on, and rabbits were perfectly fine, no problem. But when they, tested, when they did it on humans, there was the problem. If we had embryonic stem cells at the time and tested thalidomide on embryonic stem cells, they would have found that out. So yes, they need the cells, but they need the cells for people that aren't born yet. For the people that are born and are out there running around, adult stem cells work perfectly fine. So do you think policies should, policy should dictate that, or it doesn't need to be clarified more? Because it seems like we're about to just, people want to run the gamut of every sort of type of research now that uh, President Obama's kind of opened it up. Should there be stricter policies or guidelines? That's not for me to answer. 
That's for y'all to figure out. I'm not a jurist. I'm a scientist. So I will do my thing, and hopefully y'all can do your, your thing. That's our job. That's our job. That's your job. Find out. The one thing that's coming out right now, which I joined the adult stem cell group that we're a little hostile about, is the embryonic stem cell people say that because they're under FDA regulations to prove it to the nth degree that it's okay to use in humans, the adult stem cell people should be held under the same guidelines. That, to me, is horse hockey. I'm sorry. I mean, we've done bone marrow transplants for 30 years. They do IV in vitro fertilization. They're not held under FDA guidelines because they set their own guidelines of what can and cannot be done. We can set our own guidelines for adult stem cells, you know. But embryonics, I would like to see a little bit more regulation, federal regulation with respect to embryonics, because I don't want to see people walking with, you know, trunks sticking out of their heads or, you know, whatever. Um, and people right now are paying $50,000 to go to Thailand to get injected with a mixture of who knows what to try to get cured. Or they go for core blood cells. Well, it depends on how the core blood is processed is what you're going to get. Most of the time they freeze in liquid nitrogen, which gets some hematopoietic stem cells, which is okay if you want hematopoietic disorders, but if you want to cure diabetes, it isn't going to do squat. What do you know, think so that core blood? What do you mean? Is it, is it worth saving it? It depends, yes. Well, it depends on how it's processed. If you squeeze the core blood out and freeze it in liquid nitrogen, that's fine. It will save your child or some other child with a, a close to match somewhere down the road for hematopoietic diseases. If then you take the cord and freeze it at minus 80 degrees, you'll preserve the stem cells that can be used then for other, you know, for adults. So it just depends on how they process it. Right now they're processing it like they would for blood which is freezing. ATCC, one of my other presentations, American Type Tissue Culture Collection has a book about this thick on how to culture basically differentiated cells and progenitor cells. Okay, and I said it when I go through my presentation, and it works for germline lineage cells. They've read the book, they know what contact inhibition means, they follow the procedures. BLSCs and ELSCs, on the other hand, didn't read the book. They don't understand what contact inhibition means. They or multiple layers and this sort of thing. So it's just a little cutesy there when I go through on the more scientific side. I gave you a more general talk this time. Um, you know. Yes? Okay, and you said when they squeeze the blood and save the core blood, you know, what kind of disease would you say that would help? That would be hematopoietic diseases like lymphomas, um, any bone marrow, any bone marrow based diseases. Leukemias, yes, most I, definitely. I recently had a baby, and no one could really tell me if it was worth it or not. They were... Well... It was kind of like... Okay, it, it depends. And it depends on which company you go with. Some companies will charge you $5,000 for the initial yeah. thingy, and then we'll charge you $1,000 a month to store it. To store. Mm -hmm. Hey, money-making, yeah, yeah. capitalism, what's what I said, you know. <laughs> But the way they store it then <coughs> is in liquid nitrogen. So the only way it would be it would help your child would be for a hematopoietic disease. Right now, well, hopefully within two years, we're hooking up with a company that freeze dries things. So we're hoping to freeze dry stem cells. So it would be a one-time charge to freeze dry, and then we give you the cells, and you can keep them on the counter in your kitchen. And whenever you need them, you take them. We constitute them and use them. Freeze dry. Well, freeze drying. The process is it wants to freeze the in a normal cell. If you remember that big one, there's a lot of water in that cell. When ice freezes, it forms <coughs> spines. It'll break the cell membrane. Mm -hmm. Our cells are so small. There's very little water, so it can freeze dry. It, theoretically, we don't know yet. Theoretically, it could freeze dry without a problem, and then we could reconstitute and go for it. 
Is that why you can print from that negative 80 degrees Celsius too? Yes, exactly. Okay. Exactly. We don't get the crystallization. That's why. And we slow freeze. We drop one degree per minute rather than flash freezing the nitrogen, which you need for um, uh, larger cells, progenitor cells and differentiated cells. If, if this uh, uh, research, I mean, if it does uh, catch on and get to the point where uh, adult stem cells are accepted, what do you see the future for this? I mean, are there going to be things such as uh, stem cell banks for individuals? Uh, what, what do you see? I foresee biobanking. Like I said, we could biobank your cells if you needed them for the future. Um, unfortunately, in the African American population, not too many people want to either donate organs or even donate blood. We could biobank. Um, we have this compound that just increases the number of stem cells, like it's going out of style in the blood. So, from a, um, I'm a unique individual, I have close to 800 million cells running through my, per mill of blood in my system because I have a lupus. But our normal one has um, 168 million, but even double that, that's 311 million. And you freeze them down in 1 million cell aliquots, and that's what, 311 aliquots that you could use for someone else. And then you could expand to whatever population you needed to transport. So yeah, I could see a lot of uses. I mean, we're going after every single disease we can think of that is not genetic. My disease is genetic. I need an allogeneic transplant. And I went to FDA about that. And they said, no, 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 can't do that until you can prove that autology stem cells work. Once I can prove that, then I can go get, go get myself an allogeneic transplant so I can cure myself. It's very interesting, all of this. Yes, ma'am. Okay. On the news, they had a man that was a paraplegic. He had been in an accident. And he was excited about, you know, the policies that were coming out, reversing and all of that. I, I don't understand then. Would adult stem cell work for him, or would it have to be in the adult stem cell would work for him? It would work exactly the same way as embryonic stem cell would work, without the problems of cancer formation, and allergen allergen allergenicity. Okay, be that's what you were saying. So if, if that be the case, I, and I just don't understand why more people won't go ahead and push it. It's just lack of knowledge? or Lack of knowledge, lack of understanding. That's why I'm here tonight. <laughs> Donating my time Thank to Michael you. to get more people informed about adult stem cells. So uh, this is a really... <coughs> dumb question, but I have to ask you. Okay. So I understand. Go ahead. In the little pewter bowl or whatever it is. Petri dish. Petri dish. Yeah, yeah, petri dish, whatever. Okay. So when it first, when you first have it, it's embryonic. When does it become adult? I mean, is it at a certain number of days? I don't understand. Okay. Well, how do you an embryonic stem cell is in it. Once it puts it, once it's put into a petri dish, it's always an embryonic stem cell. You have to differentiate it down to an adult stem cell type, but it never be, at that point it becomes an adult. When it becomes a progenitor cell, when it's committed to a lineage, it becomes an adult cell, at which point it has it's lost its plasticity, it has a biological clock of 50 to 70 population doublings, and it will senesce and die. And we've done that to our cells, and the embryonic people have done it to their cells as well. So if you talk about biobanking, at right. what stage would you would be the best time to biobank or you know save your BLSCs, the most primitive ones? Because somebody, one of our um, one of the girls who worked in my laboratory, um, she worked in my lab for eleven years. Actually, I had her when she was four years as an undergraduate at Mercer, and I told you, pull them off the streets. Four years as a medical student, um, then I had a three years as a resident. And her idea was for people like yourself, say if you had ovarian cancer, okay, and you had to take chemotherapy, excuse me, over my phone might be. Over there, sorry about that. Okay, um, if you had to have chemotherapy, 
like in the standard one stage for ovarian cancer with busulfan. You'd wipe out your bone marrow and it'd wipe out your DNA. Okay, now, coming back out of it, you could have, you know, identical twin, on well, your business here, and get your core, potentially use your baby's core blood to reconstitute yourself. Now, the question is, if you want any more children, do you want to adopt? Do you want a sperm? Do you want a surrogate mother for a, your husband's sperm? Or so on and so forth. Or do you want your own biological kids? Tina's project was to, we were going to do it in mice, and our mouse person passed away, unfortunately, so we're going to do it in pigs instead. We're going to treat the pigs with busulfan to knock out their bone marrow, knock out the gametes. And we're going to reconstitute the bone marrow, and we're going to inject BLSCs into their gonads, specifically females, to try to reconstitute ova. And then we're going to match that with a normal male, and if we get progeny, you can have your own biological kids. That's why I would take a BLSC over an ELSC. Now the other thing I want to do is I want to create hunter killer cells. Now there's a cell that occurs in your placenta called a Hofbauer cell, and I drill this into my medical students umpteen million times. That cell is the Arnold Schwarzenegger of the macrophage cell, Terminator 3, and it'll take out anything. And I saw a demonstration and they had a 100 millimeter petri dish, and the bug, quote unquote, that formed syphilis is a little, looks like coiled spring, it's about an inch long. They put it on one side of the dish, they put a Hofbauer cell on the other side of the dish, closed it up, and a Hofbauer cell you couldn't see with your naked eye, put it in the incubator, came back the next day, spire key was deader than a doornail, and the Hofbauer cell says, come on, bring it on, give me another one, give me another one. I want to make those cells mobile. Okay, and, I want to, and there's other people that we work with that have artificial chromosome technology. So instead of, you know, you have viruses that you knock things, knock genes in with, unfortunately they knock genes out too. With an artificial chromosome, you can add any cassette gene that you want on it, put it in the cell so you'd have 47 instead of 46, but it would replicate normally. The idea is to put a cassette in there that says, okay, you go after this gene sequence. You put it in this hunter killer cell, inject it in the body. It can go after Ebola, smallpox, polio, any one of the nasty viruses. That's something I'm working on the side. Well, they used That's to a that Schwarzenegger cell. Hmm? Was it in the placenta? Yeah, it's called a hot flower cell. So it protects the embryo fetus from week three through week, week 20. If it's intact, nothing that's alive will cross that placenta and make it to the embryo. Embryo fetus. It's deader than a doornail. So you can only retract that cell from placentas? No. Or the placenta is derived from the trophoblast, which is derived from a BLSC. So if I can co culture the BLSCs with the Hofbauer cells, I can make Hofbauer cells. Yes? You had mentioned earlier that Japan is leading in the stem cell research arena right now. Is that Pretty correct? much embryonic stem cell em arena. Embryonic. Yeah. How important is it for our country and for the United States to maintain or surpass them and get the... Upper hand? Upper hand. Again, that's not a question. That's not, you know, I would go for adult stem cells personally. <laughs> not embryonics. So, All right, is anybody else in the world using adult stem cells? No. Nobody. I'm the only one in the world with totipotent stem cells, and I'm only one of three labs in the world, all in the United States, with pluripotent stem cells. There's Tony Adlett at Wake Forest with amniotic stem cells, and Maurice Radichak at University of Kentucky with a very small embryonic-like stem cell. We're the only three with pluripotents, <coughs> and we're all U.S.-based. So I would go with adult stem cells first, go with embryonics second. Embryonics, to, yes, embryonics are important, again, to treat the fetus and the embryo. But there are more adults running around in this world than there are fetus and embryos right now that can be cured if we just had the technology and the finances to do it. And you think of people that you know that might be Parkinson's, might be Alzheimer's, might be dementia, diabetes, 
COPD, um, and the list goes on and on and on. Yes? Um, I mean, it sounds like, you know, it's just endless and, it is. and wonderful, but um, do you have a primary focus at this point? Like, what is the next step for you, like, when you talk about Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, one in particular that you're really focusing on? Okay, the one I promised, there's a group out there called Stem Cell Pioneers. And they're the ones that go out to these places and get stuck for 50 to 100 to whatever thousands of dollars trying to find a stem cell technique that works. Most of these people are COPDs, chronic obstructive pulmonary, whatever it is, COPD disease. I promised them that I would go after COPD. So that's the focus of my first grant for the Anti-Stimulus Award. My first focus for a non-stimulus and non-NIH grant is a Michael J. Fox Parkinson's Foundation because we have Parkinson's data that our stem cells work in animals. So they should work in Parkinson's, in humans. Yes, I, I know at some universities, uh, major universities, they've had uh, like pharmaceutical companies that have sponsored labs that have put up, that have invested a lot of money into research. That's true. Um, have you looked to have any, in anybody like that or any organization like that uh, sponsor your research? I believe in the Walmart approach. Okay? And the Walmart approach says you bring it to the people as cheaply as possible. If I had a big pharmacy a company, they're not going to go for as cheap as possible. So that's my own thing. So I work with a foundation. It's called Dragonfly, uh, wherever the name comes from, who knows. Um, they are, you know, they will fund my research. It's basically they'll match funds. Whatever funds they get in, they will match to fund my research. So that's where some of my money comes from. I pay for, I donate part of my salary every month to Mercy University to pay for my research. When my father passed away, there were three kids, my mom, who divided his estate into five parts. One for each of the three kids, one for my mom, and one for my research. When my mom passed away, she divided her estate into four parts. One for each of the kids and one for my research. So I work off my parents' estate trust as well. So. And I try NIH and they think I'm lunatic for him, so I mean, okay, so. <laughs> Because basically I'm so far ahead of everybody else. They can't believe it's real, we've carried type and you know, on and on. We've done, gone through all the hoops they've wanted us to go through to prove that the cells are real, and they still don't believe it. So there's not much I can do about it except prove it in humans that it is real. Any Anybody other questions? Else? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Young. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you for listening to me. Hmm.